Hi everybody, welcome back to the Virtual Food Festival. I uh, hope you're enjoying your Sunday, I hope you enjoyed our first demonstration with fantastic Rick Stein and his son Charlie. We even managed to find an old college friend from way back when to come and join us. Scott, thank you for asking those questions. Uh, it's 10 o'clock and coming up we've got the amazing Cathy Slack. And let's just talk a little bit about the reasons behind doing this virtual food festival. Everybody involved is just giving their time and their love and their energy. And the idea is to try and help and support the local food producers and suppliers that have really just kind of run aground since the whole hospitality sector kind of came to a crashing halt. Here in lockdown land uh, on the virtual food festival, live channel on YouTube. We're trying to bring a bit of uh, uh, entertainment, a bit of love and positivity, as well as trying to create, um, well, trying to create an energy really, which is kind of what we're trying to do is get people to join us. Uh, we want you to subscribe on the YouTube channel. We want you to give us your feedback, your comments, say hi. Um, the other thing that we're really trying to do is raise a bit of cash as well. And the way that we're asking people to do that, it's really simple, but it's very important, is to jump on to the Crowdfunder website. You can access that through our own website, which is virtualfoodfestival.org. You can see there's a button there where you can pledge and donate. This is really the key message for us. It's the way that you can help support the industry by pledging for prizes and rewards that normally you just couldn't get. We've got an amazing prize that we're gonna draw later on, and that's to have a one-to-one -one cooking class on Zoom with Jack Stein and get all the ingredients and a bottle of Plonk sent to you as well. And that's just one of the prizes. You can also buy vouchers for the suppliers. Any of the suppliers that you can do, you can pay it forward and we can also help support them. So let's try and bring in the old mucker, Kathy Slack. So Kathy is a teacher, she's a food writer, uh, but she's also uh, an excellent bloggist, if that's the word, Glutz and Gluttony. You might know her handle. Uh, hello, Kathy Slack. Good morning, how are you, my darling? Fine, wow, you just come out of makeup. Yeah, I know. Like, this is, the, you're such a great excuse. This is the first time I've like showered and put makeup on in about six weeks. Well, I, I don't take it personally, but I haven't. It's fine, it's fine. Well, you look uh, resplendent there. Whereabouts in the world are you? I am in the sunny, well, not very sunny, Cotswolds in West Oxfordshire, in my kitchen garden, my veg patch, um, where I was really hoping it was going to be a glorious, balmy day, and actually, it's really cold. It is quite chilly, isn't it? Yeah, we, we managed to just sneakily put the heating on uh, in between the time that Rick finished uh, and you started. Um, very manicured garden. Are you sure that's not just a painted backdrop? Well, I have to say it's my first year in this veg patch. Before I've grown my own for about 10 years, but I've always been in other people's gardens because mine's not really been big enough. And the joy of living out here in the Cotswolds is, is that you can throw yourself at the mercy of local landowners and they'll give you a bit of land to grow on. But this is my first year with my own veg beds, which we put in over the winter. Um, and I'm so grateful of them now during lockdown because they're just right here whenever I want them. So, but they are quite close to a road just over the way here oh, with yeah. lots of walkers. So if we get heckled, um, that, that's why. And hopefully there won't be any tractors coming past or anything. So well, You can always play, you should be at home on lockdown. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I've got your name. Yeah. yeah, yeah, report them. Um, well, for the first year of growing, it seems to me that you're overachieving. Oh, well, thank you. I'm really enjoying it. It's nice to have time, you know, silver linings. It's nice to have some time to grow it. And I find it just so restful and relaxing and calming, which I think we probably all need at the moment, don't we? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there is this kind of strange element of uh, recalibrating and having a positive outlook. And of course, everything that we're doing now on the Virtual Food Festival is all about trying to, you know, maybe change some habits and celebrate those people and get connections between suppliers and customers. Uh, that, that's really uh, the, the whole reason for doing this. And of course, uh, getting people like yourself, just to throw in a, li a few uh, tips and hints and uh, a, a few surprises in the kitchen. What, what are you gonna, what are you gonna cook for us today? 
Well, I've got lots of amazing local um, producers to celebrate. I thought I would make it really simple, partly because I'm going to cook it in the garden, so this requires no cooking, it's just an assembly job. Um, bruschetta, spring bruschetta, so two of them. Um, one with an asparagus, some gorgeous asparagus here, nice. um, raw asparagus salad, um, and then another with some smoked mackerel and some pickled rhubarb from the veg patch and a load of lovely herbs that I've picked this morning. That sounds fabulous. The only thing that I is, I cannot stand rhubarb. <gasps> no. I know. I'm, I'm so sorry. sorry for you, Steve. Sorry about that. It's ghastly, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's such a missing element of your life. I'm going to convert you with this. Well, let's see. There's a challenge. OK. I'm going to move you backwards a bit as well so you can see what I'm, co what I'm chopping. OK. Ooh. Tell me if that works. Yeah, that works just fine. Is that all right? Yeah, lovely. Brilliant. Right. I'll crack on then, shall I? Yeah. I'm going to put you on gallery view so I can still see everything. There we go. OK. I, I think um, you're going to put me on mute. No. <laughs> I would never do that. Um, so the first thing we need to do is make the bruschetta. I can't emphasize how quick and straightforward and simple all of this is. And I really like cooking in this way because I think when you've got nice ingredients, then it's better to just let them do their own thing than get too highfalutin with foams and twills and fiddly bits on it. And also right. this is quite straightforward. So you can do it at home at the moment as well. Well, that's the idea. Um, so the first thing you need, I mean, I know this is such a, um, lockdown cliche is some bread if it can be sourdough so much the better mine is sourdough I'm obsessed with making sourdough anyway and now more so than ever and the flour I use is um, from a Cotswold mill called Matthews mill and they've been totally inundated with orders at the moment so you have to be in the know to actually get any flour from them at the moment but it makes amazing bread so I'm just going to slice that, a few Everybody's really uh, attempting to, to get onto the, the bread baking. Uh, I know, you talk, I saw Rick had got one on the go as well earlier, which I think is brilliant, so good for him. Um, the bruschettas are really straightforward. You just pop a few slices on a baking tray and drizzle them, I'm trying to make sure that you can see what I'm doing. Yep. Um, drizzle them with some oil. I've got this Cotswold Gold, which is such a lovely rapeseed oil. It's um, uh, cold pressed, so it's still got quite a flavor to it, quite a rich flavor in this amazing golden color. So liberal sprinkle of that over your um, bruschettas to be. And then this is about as chefy as I'm gonna get today. Somewhere here, I've got a garlic clove. And you carve your garlic clove. Yeah and then rub it. I'm gonna move you back a bit so you can see a bit better. There we go, that's better. Um, yeah. Rub it all over your bruschetta. And when you do this, you're a bit like, is this like when they massage beef, does it actually make any difference? Um, but I think it really does. So give it some real welly and get both sides like really infused with the oil. And then that is, sorry, what was that, Han? It definitely makes a difference to the smell of your fingers. Yeah, that's certainly true <laughs> for several days. Um, and then those, obviously you do more than this when you've got time. That goes in an oven at about 180, 200 yep. for about 10 minutes. Flip them over halfway. And now I get to do my uh, blue pewter bit. Here's some I made earlier, fortunately. And they come out and they look lovely and golden and they're super crispy and they're a great foil for pretty much anything you want to do with them. Which is, in this case, two options. Uh, let's start with the asparagus. The dog, I, I've moved the camera so you can see him. The dog has just decided that he wants to take part in this. <laughs> part, partly because he can smell the food as well, so he's excited about that. Um, you realise when you move from food to a pet, the subscriptions go up tenfold. <laughs> they probably do, don't they? Don't no, it's don't way. If, if I do an Instagram with a dog in it, it's, it's way more popular. It's ridiculous. Um, so, uh, let's do the asparagus topping to start with. This asparagus is from um, Wickham Park Farm, which are this um, a glorious farm in Banbury, um, and a load of local shops. I don't know about you, but our local farm shops have gone 
like really up to their game since lockdown and they're doing amazing produce like this kind of stuff so i'm grateful for those um asparagus this doesn't require any cooking i'm just going to chop the heads off they're uh, just super sweet and in the perfect condition capacity we've got um as, you, as you're aware on our crowdfunder platform we were uh, able to allow people to pledge to come and sit on the front row and join us and pledge for lots of other things. Uh, we're going to bring somebody in uh, at some point, but yep. we've also got our subscribers on the YouTube channel live, which is where we're broadcasting, and we've got some questions. I, I might just kind of delve in and see if there's any questions for you while you're just... Yeah, do. Whilst I peel these asparagus, I'm just cutting them into ribbons with a um, potato peeler. Okay, so I've got a question from Deborah Hollingdale. Hi, Deborah. Thanks Hi, Deborah. for watching us. Um, so, what size should my leeks get to before I plant them out? And, uh, and then the, 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 the other thing is about rabbits. Will they eat them? I'm not sure you can help about that. But um, Well, the rabbits, the rabbits is, to look, is to get a good shot um, but, and then eat them, I yeah. think. Um, but uh, leeks, I mean, ideally, leeks should be, so if you don't grow leeks, this is how you grow. The, the, the deal is that you have to grow them in a seed bed. And then when they're about the size of a pencil, is that the thickness of a pencil is what they say, you dig them up. I know it sounds really counterintuitive. You dig them up and you make a really deep hole in some soil and then you drop them into the soil like you're burying them almost. So about the size of a pencil, though I have to say, mine never get that fat before I plant them. They're usually maybe a fat chive by the time I plant them and that seems to work fine. Right, so you can, I, I'm the same really, we, we've managed to sort of dig over our veg patch, it's not a, nothing like yours, and, uh, but you know we've got some leeks and we've got some spring onions going, but you know same, we always kind of get to them before they're fully matured because we just like to use them over salads. Yeah exactly and I think that mine never quite reach that stage, they just they just don't grow. They just stop growing. They kind of stall. Yeah, I'm not sure where I'm not sure where Deborah is in the world, but um, rabbits encroaching on the garden—that's always a problem. Um, it's it is, kind of, isn't it? Um, I mean, I've got um, stone walls, which seems to stop them. Um, but um, the patch I was in before had like two layers of netting, and they still got through, and, yeah. and some chicken wire, and they still dug under. Um, yeah. I think get familiar with some good rabbit stews is the only way of dealing with it. It's a good, it's a good solution. It's a good solution. So you've um, a little bit of seasoning, a little bit more oil on your asparagus. Yes, um, a little bit of lemon and some pine nuts have gone in there. Um, and then I told you this is sort of embarrassingly straightforward. If you leave these for a couple of minutes, the obviously do more i'm just conscious that watching me peel asparagus is not a thrilling way to spend your sunday morning um leave them for a minute in the oil and the uh lemon and they will sort of marinate and all the flavors will ming mingle together and they'll soften up and they'll be soft enough for you to pile on top of your bruschetta um, and add some of the pine nuts in there as well um, and then maybe pop one of the spears on top and that's bruschetta number one. Pretty good. It makes, um, it would make a decent canapé in our house, that. Canapé? Do you do canapés every evening, Steve? On a Sunday, yes. It's a <laughs> I love that. I'm going to start doing that. I think we need some civility in lockdown, don't we? Canapés well, every evening. We do in our house. It's a bit crazy. I don't know how you're coping in lockdown, but we've got three girls. They're upstairs, locked away. We've got two dogs, the cat. You'll probably see all of them run through the kitchen at some point today. Um, how's it going for you, lockdown? It's actually, I feel very lucky that um, I do a job that I can work from home and um, we're out here in the countryside so things are quite quiet I think we're quite and I've got the garden so I can be outside I think I'm very lucky to be as protected as I am for it and I've always been grateful for it but crikey I am counting my blessings right now I have to say so and we've got the veg patch as well I picked my first radishes this week look at the size of them I'm very okay. chuffed with those so stuff like that really like has become so important in the day it's but true it's true it's very funny you just reminded me then of um 
uh, quite a lot of my friends uh, are fishermen and uh, you did that thing where you held the radish to the camera to make it look enormous and they all do that when they catch a fish yeah there you go it's as big as your head <laughs> they are pretty huge they are big though you're right um so the next topping for my next bruschetta, there it is, um, is, uh, a, I, I hesitate to call it a pate. I think it's probably not quite as chefy as that. Um, it's a smoked mackerel pate of sorts, let's say. Um, so I've got some creme fraiche okay. here. Yeah. And then I've got some smoked mackerel, which I know is a slightly unusual ingredient for the most landlocked county in the UK. Um, but we have this incredible smokery called Upton Smokery, um, just past Burford, um, which is really close to me. And they smoke so many lovely different things, including this mackerel, which has been caught in your neck of the woods, I think, Steve, and then brought up here for smoking. So. That's where all the mackerel has gone. That's where it's all going, I'm afraid, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to flake some of my Upton mackerel into here. As you can see, I'm very bothered about quantities, roughly sort of equal amounts, give or take, it's fine. Um, and give it a little mush together. That's a technical term as well. Yeah. Uh, bit of lemon juice. Um, some herbs, definitely some herbs, kind of whatever herbs you can lay your hands on. This is the joy of the kitchen garden at the moment. So I've got some fennel, this is bronze fennel. Um, and I've got some, let's put a bit of sorrel in as well. I'm really into sorrel, particularly with fish. It's really lemony and light and don't cook it. It goes really sludgy. Um, yeah, it's strangely sort of apple peel citric combo isn't it yes apple peel is a perfect definition yes that's exactly it and then i've got some um chervil as well which is going absolutely crazy in the patch so but kind of any leafy herbs that you can lay your hands on we'll chop those in oh chopping sitting down is not as easy as i'd imagined it would be um sling this in too bit of salt the mackerel's fairly salty but just a little touch more yeah um and give that a mix now that's lovely on its own but i think since we're on canapes steve for your sophisticated household six o'clock drink yeah. this evening um yeah. i think any dish but especially canapes and nibbles want to have want to really pack a punch and have something interest like real interest and in all sorts of flavors in every bite so you want this sort of smoky richness creaminess of the um pate um but with it i think you want a bit of a kick some sort of sweet and sour crunch and that's where your rhubarb comes in so i'm gonna pop that to the side and make a like the quickest pickle you could imagine with rhubarb yeah, yeah. Uh, ironically, rhubarb is pretty much the only thing we can grow in our veg patch. And you don't like it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know. Um, rhubarb, once rhubarb gets going, it just looks after itself. Mm -hmm. um, you can force it early in the year yeah. um, by putting a dustbin or more poetically a ter terracotta pot over the top of it. Um, and it will produce these really pink sweet spears or you can leave it as i do until the main harvest where it's a bit um i'm doing that fisherman thing again um it's uh, still pink but it's not quite as sweet it's a bit more sour um but it makes it perfect pickle so i'm really finely chopping it so I set, I set all my foodie friends a challenge because they all know that I'm not a massive fan of rhubarb. And I said, just what can I do with it? And all of these suggestions came back. And it seems that you have to throw a million ingredients at rhubarb uh, to make it any good. And I just said, well, surely, you know, that's just trying to mask oh. the fact that it tastes of rhubarb. Oh, no, I so disagree. Well, I'm going to throw two at it. So let's hopefully okay. bring the, the quantity down. Um, a quick, really quick pickle, which is just cider vinegar. Um, this is Willie's cider vinegar. I'm really into it at the moment. It's a really Great. Good... Does that still have the starter culture in it, the mother? Yeah, 
yeah exactly so it's good for you as well it's got some yeah, of those kind of probiotic um, yeah exactly um and then a bit of honey and roughly equal amounts of cider vinegar and honey this is um vl honey from uh, from banbury um which is super close to me as well and they make the honey makers make just delicious cotswoldian honey so spoon a bit of that in we were on our sort of hourly family lockdown walk around the village yesterday mm. and came across one of our one of our neighbors who keeps hives and uh we, we were able to take a lovely jar of of, of honey um he just spun it actually just spun the the, the hives is absolutely amazing it, it, when you taste really good honey versus sort of supermarket shop bought stuff, it's um, it's like commercially produced stuff. It's so different, I think. Um, so I've just put the, I've just mixed the cider vinegar and the honey together with the rhubarb finely chopped in a jar, and I'm just going to shake it up for a minute. And that's it. That's your quick pickle. You can do this with beetroot, cucumber, carrots, mushrooms, all sorts of things. And it adds just a kick to goat's cheese or um, all sorts of salads, or it's just a lovely thing to pile on top of almost anything. So let's finish this up. Um, I've got my mackerel pate, um, and I'm going to be just very slightly chefy. Um, and make a little. Look at you with your crenelles. Yeah, pile that on top, and then drain some of your quick pickled uh, rhubarb. Pile that on top, and that will give you a really in that sort of Scandi vibe of a salty, fishy base with a um, vinegary kick at the back of it your rhubarb will give you that flavour profile. And then let's pop a few herbs on top just for just for it to look a bit more, a bit fancier. Just to disguise the flavour of the rhubarb. Oh, shush. I want to bring this to you. This is the only downside of doing this virtually, is that I can't now bring it to you. I'm going to bring you a bit closer so you can see it um, and, and taste it and convert you to the ways of, of, ways of rhubarb. It looks absolutely stunning. And of course, you know, I'm only really pulling your leg. It's a really lovely combination. All of those kind of typically sort of Nordic flavor profiles really do engage your whole kind of mouth in, in wonderful little bite-sized flavors. And uh, they look amazing. Uh, brilliant little combo. So simple and accessible, Cathy. Exactly. And that's what I think is a particularly important at the moment is making food that is supporting local producers. You know, this is all stuff that I would normally be using in my supper clubs, um, augmented with stuff from the veg patch. But, and you know, that's just a micro example of a macro problem of me not getting stuff from these producers as much as I normally would because I'm not running the supper club. And it's the same yeah. for restaurants and shops and so yeah. many food producers everywhere. Exactly, and um, maybe it's just the perspective on my screen, but to get into your greenhouse, do you have to crawl in? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't even have this big. <laughs> right, I love it. It's oh, really, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely packed at the moment, but yeah, you do have to sort of crawl into it, Alice in Wonderland style. You're, yeah, you should, you should make another blog, Commando Gardening. I know. <laughs> Talking about the blog, are you finding uh, much time to do any writing? What's on the horizon? Um, I am writing a lot at the moment, but not blog related. But yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, next year is going to be an ex exciting time. And hopefully this year will involve lots of growing lots of veg and cooking with all my homegrown harvests as well. I'm looking forward to Supper Club starting again, which I yeah. normally do every month in Chipping Norton, which is really close to us. Um, and then writing in the meantime. I need to get back on the blog. It's been a bit quiet. Blogs were so 1990s as well, weren't they? But I feel like people are getting a bit busier with them now. Well, I think, you know, blogs and I think people are kind of moving on to sort of uh, podcasts, aren't they? And Yeah, and you know, Instagram's really busy for me as well, which I really enjoy doing. It's funny how that sort of virtual community becomes so much more important now we're 
in the middle of in the middle of nowhere in the middle of lockdown you're absolutely right and i think as a family also we know we kind of monitor screen time for the girls but they're missing their mates because they don't see them and so all those rules have sort of been relaxed and because we can't sit with each other in a restaurant or in the kitchen with you know it's what we all like to do really as food is uh, i guess this is using technology for all the right reasons so isn't it's such a great lineup for the rest of the day as well i'm gonna eat my bruschetta and make a cup of tea and sit down and watch Gizzy and Sophie and Nathan Outlaw and it's gonna yeah. be great. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah, you've done your little bit of cooking. You just have a sit down and a gin and tonic. I'm here all day. I've got, I'm gonna make, I'm actually gonna make you work a little bit harder. Please, because, please. Thank you. We've got one of our really brilliant uh, crowdfunder pledges. They wanna come in and join us on screen and ask you a quick question. We've got Deborah from the front row. Amazing. I know. It's Hi, Deborah. Not... This is so nice. Welcome to the welcome to the Cotswolds. Uh, Deborah, are you there? We're just gonna we're just gonna we're, virtually Deborah's in the green room. We're gonna invite her in to the screen. <laughs> I can see her. Hi. Hi Deborah, you all right? Yes, I'm fine. Yes, it's uh, lovely to I, I, I did your last virtual cooks and I um chef, sorry, not cooks, and uh, I spent all Easter mo Monday uh, watching you, and now I hear I am again. <laughs> that, that's brilliant. So you were the person who was watching. That's grand. Thank you for doing yeah. that. <laughs> I, I well, do want to ask a question, actually, about, you said something about the cider vinegar being live, something in it. I've never heard of, I thought cider vinegar was just cider vinegar. Ah, yes. I love a bit of cider vinegar. Um, it can come in different formats. If you don't pasteurise it, um, it can, it, you have to have a live culture to make it. Um, and if you don't pasteurize it, that live culture stays in the bottle and right. it helps the flavor, I think, but it's also good for you as we now know from live yogurts and, um, wild yeast, you know, all those kinds of pre and probiotics. It's, um, it's good for you in that sense as well. So, um, it's, and it keeps just as long, I think, Steve, do you find that as well? Yeah, it's uh, thanks. Good, great question, Deborah. It's one of those things that because it's live, it doesn't really go off. It just sort of improves. Um, it's a bit like you get fermented uh, beers, and you get that little bit of uh, sediment in sediment in, in the bottom. But uh, you know, I I was brought up, and we, we used to be given a teaspoon of vinegar in the morning uh, just before breakfast. Yes, I have heard of that actually. I've, I've, I've had friends who've done that. Sort of, yeah. Um, yeah. I tend to mix this with a little bit of honey and some um, fizzy water and it's a really mm. nice sort of six o'clock but trying not to s s reach for the gin and tonic kind of drink. So you'd buy that at a farm shop. You, I mean the supermarket yeah. vinegar is just bog standard stuff isn't it? It's not live. Yeah, no, they're, it's, they're starting to get there I think aren't they Steve? They're starting yeah, to make stuff is live. Loads of brilliant suppliers, but what, what, it, what it certainly isn't is non-brewed condiment, which is this kind of uh, false, false vinegar. Uh, talking about uh, different ingredients, shall we bring in Charlie? Shall we bring in Charlie Stein to do a, 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 a quick wine pairing with your, with your dish? Please do. Thanks for your question, Deborah. Lovely. Yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Deborah, thanks for pledging on the crowdfunder and supporting everything that we're trying to do. It's really important. Um, I can't wait to come back to Cornwall. <laughs> great. We're all, yeah, we're all, we're all going to go there for a party. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Kathy, we're going to. Um, have you ever met Charlie before? No. Oh, hi, Charlie. Charlie's tell gonna, Charlie's tell me what to put in on. the fridge and drink with this uh, with my six o'clock nibbles. Hey Charlie. Hi. Hi Kathy. Hi Steve. Hey, how's it going? Very good. Yeah, very good indeed. So uh, Charlie, um, did you catch uh, what Kathy had made or would you like her to do a little... I've, I've watched the whole thing and it sounds absolutely delicious. Um, I think what we've got there is very fresh. We've got the, we've got the oily fish and there's lots of herbs, so very herbaceous. Uh, and then the asparagus as well, which is the perfect, the best friend for asparagus is Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and so this is a Sauvignon from a really good friend of the family's that we sell in the restaurant. Um, and he's called Gavin Quinney and it's his Chateau Bedouc. Uh, and he's based down in Bordeaux. 
uh, and he sells now direct to customers. You can go on his website and you can pay prices that you would pay at his seller, uh, and he delivers all over the UK, uh, and it's his Sauvignon Blanc from the Entrée du Mer. So really fresh, very, really herbaceous Sauvignon um, with plenty of acidity as well to go with all the different flavours in your dish, Cathy. Wow. Oh, that sounds so good. If only it wasn't only 10.30. <laughs> oh, but, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah. Someday, that doesn't matter. True, it's true. Um, Dolly, we're going to put the details of that on our website, the virtualfoodfestival.org. Yeah. Uh, as with all of your recommendations and all of the suppliers uh, that uh, all our, our great demo chefs are talking about, um, after lockdown, would it be uh, okay to go and mention your name? Do we get a bigger discount? You will, yeah. I mean, he's he's an amazing chap. And if you, uh, after lockdown, when we get to travel again, you have to go and visit him. He does tours down in his amazing chateau in Bordeaux. Uh, and you can stay with him as well. And he's just he's just a really, really lovely bloke uh, and great friend of the family and makes fantastic wine. Brilliant. Well, as ever, your recommendations are always spot on. There's such a, a, a strong level of confidence in that. Um, can I just ask, though, um, sort of what sort of price would you be expecting to pay per bottle for that sort of wine? Um, so because he's doing it direct from, like I say, his seller, you're paying his, his price. So that's shipped in the UK for £11.95, which is very, very good for this level of wine. It's a really good uh, white Bordeaux. Wow, it sounds like the sort of wine you find on the top shelf. Exactly. I love white Bordeaux as well. That's such a great suggestion. Yeah, brilliant. Charlie, thanks ever so much for popping in. Thanks, thanks for your presentation and your passion about all things wine and drink. Uh, Kathy, what a lovely little demo that was. Amazing. You, darling. It's lovely to chat to you. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. We often see each other on the festival circuit and hopefully we'll share a stage again sometime in future. Charlie, take, take good care. See you soon. See you, see you later. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, bye, bye. Bye, bye. bye. Go and, put, go and put your feet up and watch us on the YouTube live stream. I will. I'm going to get some wine. <laughs> bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.